Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today, we are thrilled to be speaking to the creatives responsible for the masterful HBO documentary, Master of Light. We're going to kick things off by introducing you today to the after members who are on the call, starting with our facilitator, Jill Monroe in Los Angeles, Reggie Pounder in Chicago, Albert McGee in South Florida, Nancy Green in Baltimore, Maryland, and Carolyn Hines in Toronto. And we'll be later joined by Katya Woods from Philadelphia. I'm gonna let you guys see what you do so well, and I will see you on the other side. Eagles versus pigeons, which one would you rather be? We oh, said I want to be an eagle. Why? Because they fly higher than pigeons. And what does that allow them to do? See more. Who are you? So much of who I am today is my experience growing up in my hometown of Kansas City. My mother had me at 15. All I wanted was somebody to love me. What have I done that's so bad that you can't forgive? Mama set me up to go to prison instead of her. When the judge sentenced me to 11 years, I said, I'll show you. I think about the system that failed her. I am not what has happened to me. Your story, your experiences, your being seen, it's no accident. Well, I kind of always escape through art. If I just took the next step, the world would open up before me. Here it is, inner light within you. I am not what has happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Hi, I'm Reggie Ponder, the real critic out of Chicago. And first, I, I, I want to echo what Gil said. Uh, congratulations and uh, uh, thank thank you for doing this film. Uh, it it uh, brings up all kinds of uh, emotions. My my question is really for uh, George Anthony, and it's um, it's a question about balancing the anger, the fear, and hope. And 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 how how do you how have you been able to do that? given the fact that there, I know that that you still have hope in all the other stuff that you do with the daughter, with uh, the young man. So how do you balance all that anger, frustration, and hope uh, in this film? I, I would say therapy really does help. Um, being able to have someone that I can talk to, I went through a process of elimination and, and landed on a really good therapist and, and I, I, I've been doing therapy since I started a few years back, um, weekly, ever since. And sometimes a couple times a week, depending on what I'm going through. Um, and talking to him helps give me perspective, honestly. I, and so I wanna champion that right away. Um, I had a friend of mine tell me that, that Therapy is to the mind what Flossin is to the teeth. And I, I would say that is true. <laughs> oh, I don't floss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I think what everything that you know you see in the movie, everything that George has been through, you know, what gave him hope was art. Absolutely. And that is his hope. Then and then just, you know, leaning into your challenges and putting it into your art is what art can save the world. And it certainly saved George and me too, for that matter, all of us, I'm sure you yeah. as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Being able to express um, uh, what you're going through and what you know, we as uh, Black people go through in, in an artistic way to, um, I don't want to use the word palatable, you know, but to at least, you know, to make art out of our pain. I think that's healing and um, it's, it's, it's an international language, which I also would be noticed with the film that it resonates in uh, different cultures, even though they're not, you know, they don't know the American system. Healing through creative practice. Good afternoon. I'm Al McGee here with YETicket.com. Well, my first question, and I, I, I have two questions. 
Uh, for you, George, you're an artist and you are in the art business. Uh, who are really your customers? Are they black people, white or a mixture or things like that? How hard was it for you to see him going through this as you was filming this? How hard was it for you to experience his life as you were filming this documentary? You know, it, what we kept feeling, all of us, and I think also Roger, because we were all very involved, um, is to capture the intimacy, to be true to the story, to also kind of see what we can do to make, you know, to protect and to make sure George is okay through everything because it's his life. It's, he's, he granted all of us access. Um, and to be true, to really make sure that the truth comes, yeah, that, that people see the truth and also the systemic truth. Um, I think that was right, also very important for all, all of us, that it's not a story of like, oh, you know, he's so talented, so yeah, if you work hard, you can make it. That's, no, there is a system which he literally says, and he literally speaks about that, that even if you're talented, whatever, there's still that system in place. And I think that helped us, even when we were upset or worried, we knew, but this, had, this has to be told, this, this, this part also. Did you have a portion of the question? I forgot my portion. Oh, you're, uh, you're in the art business now. Who are your customers? Are they black, white, or the mixture of both? And is it really hard to sell your art? Yeah, um, honestly, um, it's not. It hasn't been very often um, that a black person has stepped up and had much to do with any of my project trajectory. Honestly, I, I struggle with that because coming up as an art student and, and, and graduating and starting my own teaching studio. Um, I've, all, I've only mainly worked with um, upper middle class white people. My students are upper middle class, you know, whites or other, just people that are not from my community. Um, and, and the irony of all of that is um, those are the people who were there to help me um, like get there. You know, and yet my service is, it is to my community. You know, I turn it around and give it all back to my people. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is create a space so that we can get more diversity um, in, in those spaces, in uh, classical art, um, in academia. Um, how I've survived in, 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 as far as patronage has been mainly those, you know, progressive people in the Atlanta community that could actually afford my art and have the luxury to be able to afford art as, as a um, practice um, and to go come in and purchase classes and stuff from me. And so that's, that's how um, I sustain myself for the most part in um, some commission work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Continue therapy. I've been going through it since 1987. I've been going through a therapist, so I know it works. Thank you. Thank you. I love your Master of Light backdrop. Yeah. That is so cool. Yes, and, oh, thank so, you. Yes, thank you. That thank is so you, nice to meet that. Well, thank you <laughs> also. I appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Hi, Karen Fritzer. Here's what happened and Karen Todd's podcast. First of all, thank you so much for making this film and for having it be so open about George's life and experiences. Um, so my question this time around is for George. Um, there's a question you ask at the beginning of the documentary where you're, where you're questioning what your purpose is. And that's a question that it's a very existential question that many of us like face regularly. We're like, what is our purpose on this earth? And my question is kind of, I want you to answer this is, do you think that perhaps your purpose is to use your art to show black people as, as who they really are? Because your, 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 your style and your technique is very um, hyper-realistic in some senses and is very classical and Baroque in, others, in other forms. But do you think that perhaps your purpose is to show the black community and black people who they are in a way that they haven't seen themselves and for people to see black community, the black people in a way that we aren't necessarily shown in art. I, I'd say short answer to that is yes, but you know, not necessarily limited to that only, but yeah, absolutely. That's definitely been um, a motivation of mine. I had a person ask me a question about that recently and I, and I thought about Muhammad Ali 
um, in terms of what was his purpose. You know, here we have this great athlete and, and, and it's a good question of, of was it his purpose to just be a great athlete or was it was his purpose something greater? Great, thank you. And I love the whole, the reference to Muhammad Ali because his his sport is what helped to um, for, to push forward the civil rights movement. So you can use your art to do so many things. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Green with Film Critique. And uh -huh. I wanted to, hi, um, I wanted to know, uh, you talk in the movie about therapy and we see you um, going to therapy. Can you talk about how that has impacted your art and if you feel like it's um, made improvements or um, you had some struggles with incorporating that? Very much a, a, a process of um, struggle. Um, but when I say healing through creative practice is, is, is real, um, I mean it because my art is literally a mirror of what's happening inside of me. So it gets to be this template through which I can channel, um, you know, maybe this idea of how I want to see my mother or maybe this darker side of myself can come out in a self portrait or this depiction of my nephew because that's definitely not his character um, or who, who he is as a little boy. Um, and, and somehow in, in the painting of that and the mirroring of that on the canvas, some, there's some reconciliation and healing that takes place with certain aspects of my own psyche. Um, and so I really do use my, my art as therapy, my therapist, we, we, uh, I write my dreams down every day, we go into dream interpretation and analysis. I paint those dreams. Um, I, uh, it's just very much linked and it always, it kind of always has been. Hi, Jill Monroe, Access to the Life. Um, when you make the decision to document your life, especially your story with as many personal stories that are involved in telling this story, but it also involves the stories of other people, your mother, others, where there's um, difficult relationships to explore. How much conversation happens before you decide to go ahead and do this? And then when they agree to be on camera, are there conversations before to set up the conversations that you have on camera or the situations you explore? And what was that experience like? Because in a way it's like addressing it twice because you address it on camera in the moment and then whatever the fallout is afterwards. The, the style of the doc really mimics closely the style of painting that I do. And that's this unstructured, naturalistic verite style that honestly kind of happened for the most part that way. So when you see um, my surprise when I'm learning that my mom uh, had something to do with my incarceration more than it, it was honest, like it came out just like that. There was no uh, rehearsing the moment. There was, it was like when it was said, I, I looked up and I did, I did look at Rosa at the same time and she was just on it, kind of recording it. And um, we just continue. And a lot, of, a lot of moments was just spontaneous like that. And I think that's honestly um, um, the gift of having a, a, a woman director like Rosa, who's very intuitive and just, just was like, just responding to the moment. Um, and she didn't allow for that. Honestly, we, we just, that's just not her approach. You know, I would try to think in terms of a plan or, you know, have some kind of structure because you're going into the, to the trenches and everything that we may have thought that way around, none of it made, made the film. It, it's, it was all the most spontaneous, natural moments that ended up eventually uh, getting edited in. Um, and so we just embraced the chaos, honestly, yeah. Way of putting it, embrace the chaos. Yes, and being there all together, right? Because you would, Rosa uh, did a lot herself. She shot also a lot herself. We didn't have like a big crew. It was really small, and intimate. Uh, I would wait like in another apartment or close by, just to, you know maybe be there or support, but not be on in there because it's in their house, in their apartments, in their lives, and being together. I think right, just 
spending New Year's together, spending Christmas together, and then oh, ooh, let's like just yeah. like George said, oh, let's take the camera, but really being with you. Yeah, lots of quiet moments in their lives. Yeah, just just you know, human moments, dancing, enjoying one another, and and kind of allowing it to happen. George, I want to uh, kind of tap into that uh, creative part of you and ask. Um, you you said that. In, in the film that the world is really set up for uh, certain people to, to, to fail. And I, I wonder as a, as a dreamer, as an artist, as a hopeful person, what would the picture of success, what does the picture, if you were to paint it, of success look like? I know, it's really good. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny because, I mean, um, there was a scene in the film around the fire and my brother was asking me, what is success? And I'll just kind of stick with that, this idea of um, accomplishing whatever one's goals is. But in my instance, I'm, I'm assuming you're asking, what are my goals? Because it can vary uh, from person to person. We all have different goals. And the accomplishing of it might be your definition of success. And it, it, it'll differ from person to person. So um, honestly, just being able to um, continue to heal through my creative practice, to have the space and the freedom um, to make art as a form of healing, but it's also initiatic. Like I learned so much in the research and in the making of it that like it, it transforms, it's, it's a transformational process. And I, I, I am appreciating the privilege that, um, that is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a privilege. And I mean, I don't take it lightly. Um, and so to be able to just be in my studio or being in, in my creative, safe space, sacred space, able to do what I love um, and have enough for my life would be my idea of success off the fly. You know, I could say a lot of things, but I'll just say that. I, I, I love that, but I saw the both of you as well kind of kind of spark to that question. So if you have a thought on that, please share. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. No, I think what I love so much about working with Jordan and with Roger is working on such important stories and being and it being an artistically beautiful. What I love very much is that we were able to make an artistically beautiful film also inspired like you know, George, by his style, by the, you know, darkness and lights, all the colors, and also uh, be truthful about societal injustice. And for me, that is my, for me personally, that's my definition of success. I love doing this work, and I'm very grateful for One Story Up for giving me this amazing opportunity to be a producer on this. And if, I mean, that I were able, that I were part of this is literally my biggest dream come true. I'm not from, the I'm from the Netherlands. My mom is Russian. My dad is from West Africa, from Cameroon. And being a little girl and thinking that I would ever be in New York City, sitting here with this panel, with this movie, with these two people, I would not have, I mean, I never would, I would, no. So I'm literally living my success and with, with ethics, which for me is very personally important because, you know, that's, you know, how I was raised. So it's, I'm living it. This, this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm living it to be truthful and to make something incredible and be with wonderful people. Yeah. Um, my turn. Yes, your turn. <laughs> I was stalling. Um, um, I mean, success for me is being true to myself as an artist. Success for me is the, um, when I look at a piece of work, whether it be a documentary or a narrative film or VR, whatever I'm doing, that being that it is that have I been true to myself? Have I been honest? Have I told, have I gotten to a deeper truth that is maybe a little frightening for me? And have, have I exposed that truth and done something that I think will touch people's hearts? That's what success is. Thank you very much. This is Al McGee again. This is to the producers. How did you get to know about George and then how did they bring this project to you where you wanted to produce it? And what got you excited about producing this documentary about George? And George, my final question to you, to you is, uh, you mentioned that darkness is my friend. 
Is that still true to your life? Let's start with the producers first. Yeah. Um, uh, Rosa had come to me. I met her at an event I was doing. I was showing a film, um, American Jail, about, about mass incarceration in um, Amsterdam. And Rosa came to me and she said, I have a trailer of something I've been working on and uh, you know, I'd love for you to take a look at it. I dismissed that because I always get approached by people um, showing, wanting to show me stuff and wanting to you know, pitch stuff. And, um, but uh, a few weeks later, um, George sent some, some rays through the solar system and he said, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, it, and it connected with me and, um, and I was, I was sitting in my apartment in, in Amsterdam and I said, I better go look at that trailer right now. And I went and looked at the teaser and I was blown away by the power of the storytelling and the power of the story. And George's story, which is, you know, inspiring and his talent as an artist. And I, and I just couldn't believe it. And I said, I've got I've, I've to produce this film. And I invited um, Rosa to lunch and told her I wanted to produce the film. And we um, came to New York um, and we, um, uh, we, I connected with um, Ilya, who's in the other room, who's um, a producer in the Netherlands, uh, and Anusha. And we pitched it in New York and there was a bidding war and the rest is history. <laughs> oh, great. And Sure. Yeah, is your no, story the same? Yeah, so I, I was working uh, at One Story Office as, you know, starting out and learning the trade, coming from another career in the Netherlands. I was a, a writer, a actress, producer of theater, TV, and activist. Um, so to be to be working at One Story Office was like already like amazing, just doing research and helping out with other projects. And then all of a sudden, you know, I see George, Rose, and Ilya walking in. And all of a sudden, George was like, I think you're ready to, you know, do more. So... I want you to be part of this as, as our American producer. So, I mean, I mean, completely blown away. And also for George and Rosa and Ilya to have that trust, you know, Roger had seen my work and seen me working with him, but for them to trust me on such a big project was also, uh, I'm still, I'm so grateful for that. And yeah, I had seen this, you know, Roger had shown me like, what do you think? And incredible, blown away, like two artists working together, Rosa and George together making that it was, yeah, literally amazing. Wow, that's really great. And George, you stated that darkness is my friend. Is is that still like in your life, but you got more light in your life now? I think the the the, the way to interpret that may be okay. How about this? We all should be familiar with Frankie Beverly and Maze. Love him. Joy and pain. And pain, yeah. Joy and pain. Like, like sunshine, sunshine and rain. rain. Sing it. Joy, Joy and pain. And pain. Like sunshine <laughs> and rain. But he made a point. He said, so just like a flower needs sunshine and rain, it's all right. They're both one and the same. And I mean, you know, I was with a friend who um, helped produce Lauren Hill last night. She had a song called Everything is Everything. And, and, and it's this idea, like Rumi, Rumi said, um, what hurts you blesses you. Darkness is your friend. And the embracing of the beauty that could be found in life's most harsher moments, the lessons that could be learned, um, these principles have been communicated since the beginning of time. So my embracing of darkness as a friend is speaking to that truth, as well as speaking to my dark mother and how we should all look more at our own unconscious shadow selves and, and, and uh, mind that for, for the beauty that could be found there. And, and it'll, if you don't, it won't be a friend to you, that's for sure. It'll, it'll come to the surface in the forms of projections, complexes, you know? So I got acquainted with my dark side and, and, and was able to reconcile that. And because of that, I feel like it makes me a more whole person as opposed to a person who um, may not have gone through anything or decided to uh, deal with those more harsher truths or memories or traumas. And so I embraced it. I embraced it. I look for the beauty in it and, and
ways to grow from it. And in that sense, it was a friend to me. And I think in that sense, it's a friend to all of us and that we should all um, not run from life's pain, but stand it, face it, and, and try to see what we can extract from it. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Much more success to you in your life. I really appreciate you. And this is a great documentary. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carolyn again. So earlier, George, you mentioned that the way how the film is shot is similar to your painting style. And that was something I had picked up during watching because it's not linear. And it's not like you, you can't predict what's going to come next, which is like a painting like you can start painting the nose, then you move on to painting a different body part. And but for the for all three of you, um, I, I want to ask what about creating this film made you see yourselves and the art of painting differently for you, George, like how was it? What was it like being able to basically step literally step outside yourself and see how you are as a painter? and how you are as a painter with regards to how you relate to your family, especially your nephew, because you're becoming an inspiration for him and how he sees himself as a young black man growing up and how he sees himself as an artist. And for you, Roger and Anusha, for the, for the two of you, how was it like, what was it like watching this film and watching how it was pieced together as a piece of artwork in and of itself reflecting George's work and how that made you see the art of filmmaking differently than how you thought about it before. So um, George, we can begin with you and then we can go with, Ra um, with Anusha and Roger. Yes, okay. Well, um, as an art student, um, my teachers introduced me to filmmaking. They told me, um, if you wanna paint better, study film. And they even gave me a few films to look at and, and had sent me links to round table discussions with filmmakers and, um, and then I would meet this perfectly, it's just like Rosa was made to do this film. She was perfectly made for the job and I meet her and we're able to find the commonality uh, between cinema, which to me is the synthesis of all the art forms. Um, it, it, it brings all the art forms together beautifully. Uh, I, I believe if Rembrandt or people like Da Vinci, even older than him were alive today, they, they'd be filmmaking. In, into cinema. And that was my, my goal all along. Um, and I was able to study it from the perspective of fine art, fine art theory, find that commonality with my filmmaker. And yeah, like that really informed my practice as a painter and, and also was the beginning of my apprenticeship as a filmmaker as well. How did it impact it? Uh, the study of light, the study of design, how to how to uh, crop, uh, find beautiful um, um, cropping within a frame, and, and you know the emotional impact, the metaphor of light, the emotional impact of how to how to just frame a shot. Like we we all have this similar um, kind of thought process, in whether I'm I'm making a composition from a painting uh, or for a painting or a phot photograph or or uh, cinema. And it, it really informed my work through the back door in all those ways and more than I can even uh, mention now. And I'm sure um, the director will probably say the same thing. Yeah, so for me as a producer, um, I knew already of uh, Roger's work. So that's why I was so lucky to know to be a part of, uh, become part of One Story Up. And um, I've seen, of course, you know, I've seen uh, News of Prudence, God Loves Uganda, Life Animated, and like what, you know, Roger said, to be truthful to yourself, to the story, to make something you really, really believe in and bring the best, you know, out of it. Um, that that was, for me, incredible to see with this movie, which, which is such an intimate story, which is so also George's story, uh, that we were, a were able to do that. Uh, that it, it it turned around everything for me about making film also because as we all know, there's a lot of films that are made about um, African-American uh, pain, suffering made by white people, by white directors, white producers, you know, white executive producers. And it was amazing to work, you know, with, in a, with a black, black owned company and Rose as a white director, but she gave a lot of space to me, even as a starting producer, to, uh, to, to everybody who was involved. Uh, and our team was very diverse. And it was amazing to see you see that that is an incredible important role to keep on 
going and to keep, you know, to do that, that we can tell our own stories. For me as a producer that made this completely clear that we can do that and that we have to do that and that you see this the beauty that comes out of that. So yeah, it was amazing. And for you, Roger? Um, I think every film has a life of its own and it becomes something completely unique. And this film is such an organic film that grew out of the art itself and out of George's art and his approach to art and that the film and the, the material, the subject, the can meld together beautifully. This is an example of an all, you know, organically connecting together to be part of the storytelling in such a beautiful way that you don't often see in filmmaking. A lot of times in documentary, there's a separation, you know, kind of a little bit what Rich was saying too, there's a separation between the subject and the process of this filmmaking. And this was this was something that was just organically fused together. And what you get is this absolutely stunning and truthful portrait and story um, that that has its own unique sensibility that is so closely connected to the sensibility of George's paintings. It's like George's paintings come to life in a film in, as a film. And that's what yeah. is so beautiful. Yes. Very beautiful yeah. Story. yeah, George's paintings come to life. In film. As exactly, film. as a film, yeah. No, thank you so much. And I love that the film is so raw and it's so unpredictable and it's not like super structured because that's what painting is. Like even the way how it starts out with the palette, with the colors being mixed with the palette, like you gotta go from the raw material and you, you can only find the beauty in it once you once you see the final picture. You don't know what you'll end up with at the end. So I love that you guys were so open and honest with um with the film and that George that you and your family were so open and honest with each other in the film so like it's hard to watch those kind of things on screen sometimes as people who aren't related to what we're seeing as a, as an audience it can be hard to watch families fight and struggle when it's a real family and not like a scripted show and, and not a scripted film so but so we appreciate all of the honesty that you guys um show to us and that you show to each other thank you so I wanted to know um, from each of you, what were some of the major challenges that you had in bringing uh, this documentary to the screen and how did you overcome them? I mean, definitely also COVID. That was, you know, COVID. the midst of the <laughs> pandemic. And like right at the start, we didn't know what was gonna happen or how, what was going on. So that was, Right, real. Yeah, I mean, Rose has spent the most of COVID in, you know, locked in an apartment in Atlanta. Um, and uh, COVID is always, you know, it's been a challenge for all of us, especially in filmmaking and documentary. Um, so that was a challenge. Um, you know, documentaries are written in the edit room. And when you have such a wealth of material, lots of material, and putting that together in a piece of story, and I think uh, Ephraim Kirkwood, our editor, who is a first-time African-American editor, um, did an amazing job. He's a, Ephraim is a discovery. He's someone who, you know, at, here at One Story Up, we just nurtured and gave him this opportunity and he's, look what he's done. Yeah. He's created this amazing recipe. But I think it's always a challenge when you're in the edit room and you have, you know, thousand hours of footage. You have to make a hundred, uh, make it to an hour and a half, make, create an hour and a half cohesive film. He did it in such an organic, beautiful way that fit with the organic beauty of George's art. Yeah, and George you trusting know. us to, right? Giving yeah. that, because for him, yeah, that, you know, to, Trust uh, Ephraim to do that, and, and of course, one story up. Yeah, and I think also, yeah. yeah, and I think also when you're in a crisis, and there are many, as you see in the film, many crises that that happen. You know, that's a challenge. What do you film? What do you not film? 
you know, how is, where is, where is George in this moment when he's dealing with the crisis of his siblings or his mother? Like, you know, there's, it's always, that's always a push pull struggle in documentary and real life. We're dealing with real life situations and people are, you know, being incarcerated and going to the hospital and getting arrested. I mean, this is like the real life. And how do you stick, how do you, you know, when do you, is there a moment where you put down the camera and you're like, oh, this is crazy. I, 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 or, do, or do you keep going and, and, and you know, stay calm? Those are each of those moments and you see in the film, it's a challenge for the filmmakers and a challenge for George who's, he's going through it, but he's also thinking about the film. So he's like thinking on two different levels. He's like, okay, I'm going to bail my mother out of jail, but also I'm making a film. And I'm, so it's like, it, that's not easy. That is really, really, really difficult. So, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they answer exactly how I would have answered in the portions that were about me because they felt it more than anybody else, for sure. They, they were right there. Um, and uh, those creative struggles were real because I was ripping the Band-Aid band -aid off of wounds that um, I didn't have to go back so deep into. I could have just ran as far away from my family as I could get and never turn around. Um, and so the creative, the creative process would have been like the hardest part because it has so much to do with my, my, my healing journey. And it was an honest healing journey. It was, it was raw. It was, um, organic things happen, they came up unstructured, unplanned, and we just had to handle it in real time. And so I, I, to echo what they said, it's just juggling of art and life and bringing the two together as, you know, as my challenge, my main challenge. To approach the easel or to approach your craft and you, you have all this chaos and turmoil. And, and like Roger said, like living in crisis mode from day to day, um, and yet you're supposed to bring this, this equanimity to the easel and make something beautiful. Um, I, that's when I began to see how much privilege it takes to make that kind of art. Yeah, it's really a luxury to be able yes, to it's be- It's a whole luxury. Yeah, let me be a painter. I'm just gonna close the door, yeah. just be in my studio. Don't bother me for eight hours because I'm an artist. Ooh, that's, wow, that's- right such a privilege and luxury who can you know not a lot of people who can afford or can do that nice thank you so much and i thought it was um, a really thoughtful film and the artwork was great and i would actually like to see this as as a series because i'm i'm very curious about um you know your relationship with your mother and and um the things that you're going through so yeah it was it was very nice thank you Thank you. Yeah. Follow George around. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on some screenwriting, that's for sure. Yeah. Hi, guys. Sorry. Party. I was a little tardy. Uh, Katia Woods, couple of social with the Philadelphia Tribune. Um, I think one of the things is, is that, you know, too often when we talk about someone going to prison, we want you to be like, there's like your rehabilitation process has to be like really during and hard and people want you to endure hardship. How much do you want this movie to inspire to people also take a different approach? Because some people are in prison due because of series of failures from us in society that capitulated in and you getting there. It's not just like you, I mean, some people are, but not everybody that ends up in prison woke up just being a horrible person. Most people, it's a series of things that lead to this outcome. And the question, and the question around, around that New, that can you just ask, ask that question? And my question is like, how much do you feel like we need to take a different approach? It can't just be about rigorness and harshness that that also needs to be like, okay, let's figure out if this, because not, I think a lot of people are salvageable, you know what I mean? But prison pretty much is set up to be like, make you worse instead of better. And you had the luxury of having the art but a lot of people don't have that so how, how what is it that you want people to see about that process about saying hey 
not everybody. We can't use that approach with everybody, you know, just being right. harsh. Some people need healing, like right. real healing. Right. That was a that was definitely a huge message that that we wanted to send as well, because not everyone deserves to be discarded um, or to be seen as just this super predator or um, somebody that should be murdered in the streets for wearing a black hoodie or any of that. And those stereotypes are what I want to change. Um, and someone in a similar situation in prison, um, I think scenes in the film really speak to the answer or my feelings around how I would answer that when I was, um, it was New Year's Eve and I was talking to my sister. I get these questions all the time around like, what makes you so different than all your other siblings? Like you grew, you grew up in the same household as them and you know, you guys have the same influences and programming. Um, and I think the answer to that question is similar um, to the answer that I would give to your question is this idea of having this fire or this determination inside of you to um, um, decide that you're not what has happened to you, but choose what you want to become in a sense. And like you got other people telling you what you are, you know, you got inmate numbers, you're a convict, you're, you know, the judge didn't see me as worth, worthy of much. And it took a tremendous amount of inner uh, will and determination to just deprogram, you know, all of these ideas that I grew up having about myself and the movies I was watching and the music I was listening to and my, all of my influences. And I just got introduced to certain knowledge and books that, that felt like they, they were written by the hand of God themselves. And, and, I, and I honestly began to see the systemic trap and thought like, why would I walk into it? I wouldn't, you know, whoever or whatever it was that set this up, the system to be the way that it is, regardless of how, you know, people may feel about it. Now, now that I'm aware of it, it's a choice. And it really fueled that spirit of wanting to, to, um, to uh, prove wrong the judge maybe who thought my life was worthless or the people who walked away from me. But at the end of the day, whatever a person does to, to find that inner strength, you got to find it because I mean, what may motivate one person may not motivate the other. I just had to psych myself out. You know, I, I, I saw prison as, as college, you know, I'd be in there watching stomp the yard. I go to my cell and cry and think like, okay, I'm not about to sit in this TV room and just watch movies all day with everybody else. What's the movie list this weekend? Or what, what we playing cards, we playing table games, we playing football, basketball. I said, no, I'm gonna like grow wings that will help me fly and never come back to a place like this. And I spent every waking moment um, obsessively focusing on my craft, reading the books that would, um, educate me about it, only talking to people that could like raise my consciousness. I was meditating with Chinese Tai Chi masters, looking like a weirdo, but just determined to never come back because I saw these people had job security uh, centered around me coming back. Like they didn't have no programs for um, my rehabilitation at all. Like I had to order my art supplies. I had to... Um, uh, you know, they had jobs there for pennies on the hour and they were trying to force you to do this slave labor. And I just began to see that, that and I didn't blame anyone but myself. Like, how did I walk into this trap? How did I not see the setup? You know, I look out my window, liquor store, pawn shop, drugs, dope fiends, right in front of me, drugs right there. How, how, do, I, how do I not walk into that? And um, that's what I began to see. And that's what empowered me because at that point, I knew that there were people, like I told my nephew, I'm talking to myself, there's people that don't want to see you live out here. And he's like, hold on, that actually scares me. And he's like, I, I get that, but what do you, I said, I get that, but what, do you, what you can do is um, arm yourself with knowledge. And that's what I did. So I was talking to myself in a lot of ways when I was um, talking to, to him, I was talking to my younger self and talking to other people who might find themselves, I mean, it's all in the film. It's really all in the film. 
What makes it so difficult is it is an industry, right? Prison system in, in America is an industry. You know, I can list all the numbers of how unfair balance it is, how many, you know, white people are in prison versus black people. Uh, if you look at, you know, how drugs is being um, prosecuted, if it's wheat or if it's crack or if it's regular cocaine, we all know, we all know that. I was in there making Bob Barker soap and shower shoes and um, clothing um, for different organizations. And um, it just seems to me like um, prison is a modern um, um, kind of extension of the, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and and, and that's, that's just, if you know that, it's like a roach, right? Like you see somebody, a roach, you see a roach, if you try to kill a roach, it's gonna run and fight for its life. I mean, I just think that's natural for anybody to do it once you become um, awake to the fact that someone's trying to take it. I just fought. Thank you. Glad you're here and you made it out to the other side. Thank you. Great. Joel Monroe again, this question is for all of you actually, but starting with George, you mentioned earlier about how the consumers of your art as well as the students that you teach are upper middle class, often not um, black. So as producers of this film and for you as being the subject of it and knowing that information, who do you hope that this film reaches and touches? And how do you think that we can introduce art back into the black community? Well, historically the um, HBCUs were always some of the most um, supportive patrons of the African-American artists. And so a lot of our campaign and outreach is um, getting my teaching studio which is in Atlanta, um, involved with some of the, the HBCU efforts, similar to like one of the only African-American artists that we know of, Henry Oswald Tanner. He moved to Atlanta, did, did something similar, I think with Clark. Um, but getting, getting this kind of training, these principles into certain communities that, that um, I, I believe it, it, it helps people on a behavioral level, you know, mental stability, you know, being able to paint and, and as, you know, as a form of healing through creative practice, um, as an outlet, there's just so many benefits to it uh, that that that's that's where you know the direction I choose to go in with uh, helping the, the young people, the schools, um, yeah, those institutions, academia. That's that's kind of the direction I wanted to go because I started a, a teaching studio, and and although I do teach uh, people from privileged communities, I, I make space for the for the younger people. I lead tours to Egypt. Um, I'm trying to get young people, I'm part of an excavation site in Egypt where we're um, excavating a tomb and all I see is young um, white kids there getting their their um, um, credits, you know, for, for their for their um, degree program and nobody from our community yet. I'm at a 25th dynasty tomb um, looking at African faces on the wall. Um, and so these are the kind of efforts that I'm making that are much more long-term, that are involved in way bigger dialogues than, than you know, what may be trending at the moment. Yeah, we work with Represent Justice for, for uh, an outreach to get more information out there and uh, for schools and, and also uh, uh, we, we have, we have talks with like universities, with also HBCUs, juvenile, and yeah. also with, ju with juvenile detention centers, also organizers, and also in the art world, movers and shakers in the art world who need to invest. But also, I mean, politically, like in New York City, I went through the same with my children. If your child goes to public school in a neighborhood where the house price, housing prices are lower, the public school gets less money <laughs> than a public school in a neighborhood where the house housing prices are higher. I mean, that's just a literally unfair political, um, you know, systemic injustice that we also need to be very aware of. So the kids, the school, the, the public school where my children went to didn't have those kind of art programs because they didn't get the same money as the kids did in an also a public school in a quote unquote better neighborhood. So that is a systemic injustice we have to really, really, really realize. Again, goes again to the same, the luxury of making art, of being educated in art, maybe if you don't get it at home, but you also don't get it at school because of a systemic injustice. 
So I think we all, as you know, as Black people, have to be very aware of that politically and speak to our local, uh, you know, local politicians. Be more involved politically, and that's also what we're doing with Represent Justice. So these are issues we are discussing. Absolutely. Okay, this question is to George. How do you market your art? Uh, do you do that yourself personally, or you have a, a agent or somebody like that to help you market your art? Um, short answer, I have no, I haven't been like focused on the marketing aspect of things, just more so consuming, studying, and, and now is the time for a lot of that. And so um, the output is increasing and picking up. And now the conversations are arising around management, um, representation, marketing, and that is very much still being discussed right now. We're looking at um, exhibition that's going to tour with museums, hopefully. Oh, that's great. I want to thank you very much. And also I want to thank the producers again. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, so my last question is for George. So I wanted to, I was very curious about what was it about the classical style of painting as we know it that drew you to it as an art medium, apart from other um, different versions of painting that drew you to that medium, especially because it's one that we don't necessarily get to see that people depicted with often. So what was it that drew you to that particular art style? And how has that um, affected the way you're, you're, you relate to your nephew? Because he's so much younger. And I noticed that his drawing is more of an animation or animated cartoon style, uh, style of art when he was drawing. So how has that helped you with relating to your nephew? So I, I like this idea of truth and beauty and beauty as truth. Um, and so I, I like truth and looking for the beauty in, in nature that, that, you know, in truth as well. And um, um, there's this, these philosophers in the early 19th century, there's just been a lot of structural and systemic racism with phrenology, with skulls, with like Africans and African art, what Africans can do versus what the Euro European artists can do. And a lot, of, a lot of those narratives came in around the 19th century. And um, there was a guy named Kant who would make these statements about how um, Black people can't like do it. They can't look at something, conceptualize it in their mind. Major philosopher. And, and reproduce it. And, and this was part of a time when like all the industries had like these racist ideologies toward people that look like us. And this, my school was born out of that. My school is a proponent of it. And this, this actually is um, a, a huge motivating factor for me. When, when, I, when I, I began to understood, understand how laughable it was to my teachers, to the, to the academic art world, that I would approach this, this discipline of trying to actually understand anatomy, physics, color, perspective, all of these alchemy, all of these things I heard you speak about, like this alchemical stages earlier, like this stuff, composition, design, they don't think the African mind can even begin to conceive of it. And I wanted to challenge that. And plus you found out the source. And then just happened yeah. to find that everything in the Renaissance, how the Moors contributed, how, you know, they got it from North Africa, like, it, you know, like it, it's endless. And so I became very much inspired by the African contributions um, to world history uh, via fine art and the Renaissance, the history of uh, the Renaissance, the classical art. Great, thank you so much. And yeah, the the Moors, and I know about phrenology because I read about that in Nell Urban Painters, but the history of white people, she talks a lot about how white black people were pushed out of the art scene and sculpting and all of that. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, it's a connection between all of that and what we're all experiencing today exactly. collectively. First universities were in North Africa and East Africa. That were the first universities on the whole planet. One was uh, started by a woman. So in Africa, when Europe was there's literally in the you know Middle Ages. Let's give it up to Timbuktu and Mali and Mali. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this documentary uh, is tremendous, and we certainly hope that. Uh, it finds the audience that it deserves. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film and TV critics, thank you for watching this edition 
of Africa Roundtables. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Black Film Critic. Yeah.